Hi, um, thanks so much for coming to this talk today. Um, my name's Emily Gosling and I'm a design journalist currently working at Creative Review as a senior writer. And we are talking to Ricardo Falcinelli today, who you may or may not have heard of um, from his fantastic book, Chromarama, um, How Colour Changed Our Way of Seeing, which came out in early November in its English version. Um, it's available kind of, as the cliche goes, in, in all good bookshops. And um, it's a really, really fascinating book um, because it's not really in many ways sort of about colour. It's about everything from history to biology, psychology, semiotics, advertising, consumerism, sweets, clothes, um, you name it, colour kind of feeds into it, which is, I think, the, the big takeaway from this book. And it's an absolutely fascinating kind of lesson for us all in staying curious and, and how we look at the world and how we think about what we're seeing. And I guess the importance of um, keeping, keeping critical and keeping questioning and not taking everything at face value. Um, but Ricardo will talk much more eloquently on that. Um, I'll let him introduce himself, but just in brief, um, Ricardo's a graphic designer. Um, his studio goes under the name Falcinelli & Co. And he also teaches at the ISIA Faculty of Design in Rome. Um, so yeah, thank you very much, Ricardo. And um, tell us a bit more. Thank you, Emily. Um, right, so I prepared a very brief presentation of some images to introduce the spirit of the book and the argument I dealt with during the years I've been working for the book. Right, so um, I have been teaching for 10 years psychology of perception applied to design to design students. And what is about? Psychology of perception is about what happens in your mind when you look at something that can be a piece of art, um, a piece of design, an image. And it's, it's, it's a kind of discipline that um, make you questioning yourself about what you are really seeing. And after a while, I found myself using a lot of uh, example and case study about color and many, many, many more during the years. So at a certain point I said to myself, well, this can become a book about all these things. So I, I'm, I'll share my screen. Right, um, this is a um, quite famous picture by Giotto, is uh, Judas kissing um, Jesus. And why I start from this? Because one day I was um, uh, scrolling my um, Instagram feed and this painting um, appeared in front of my eyes. And then I watch it and then I move across the, the smartphone and then this happened. I had Giotto and just after that, I had the Simpson. And one thing that I, start thinking and noticing because of course of my um, profession uh, as a graphic designer and uh, design teacher was that the Simpson are yellow and the dress of Judah is yellow. I try to um, measure that kind of yellow with Photoshop and it came out quite the same. And so I um, said, this is a good, starting point for, for a lesson to the students. Asking what is the difference of a yellow from the Middle Ages and a yellow that we see today on the screens? Because something happens, what happens in our mind when we look at a, a fresco and when we look something that is so bright as a, a picture on a screen, computer or smartphone or whatever you, you can think of. And this is what happens. And this is what we have been working and thinking at school and discussing about. We have two different skies in this picture. One is from a painting of the 17th century. The other one is from a comics from the um, 70s of the 20th centuries. One of the main difference is the approach people had and we have today about color. We 
tend to talk about color in contemporary society as flat surfaces. When we say something is blue, something is red, we are thinking about something that is really flat, is a, a sort of um, general idea of blue, red, yellow. And it's, it was quite unusual in the past of thinking like that. If you look at this, of, of the sky on the uh, left of the screen, you can see that there are a lot of uh, subtle movement in the paintings. You don't have a flat white or a flat blue. You have something that moves, that is in, in a way is not, um, it's, it's really irregular. And if you look at something like this, this is a, a Lego toy and a wall from Pompeii. So 2000 years ago, you can feel the same thing. I mean, the, the material we deal with in contemporary society are flat, homogeneous, bright, while in the past, it's not just because this wall has been ruined during the years. It was really meant like that, to have something vibrating in the color. And so I ask my students, why do you think in the past irregularities were so common in, in design artifacts, in, in paintings, in arts in general? And why do you think in, con in the contemporary world we are so fascinating and we desire this kind of simple color? where the yellow is just yellow and is flat and is homogeneous and continuous. And so we started um, studying what were the colors used by the artists before industrialization. Here you have some of them and we had, and they had pigments found around the world. They had stones, they had plants, they had small animals. And this is a map of where this color came from. For example, if you look at the blues, um, we have two kinds of blues, a dark one and a bright one. Uh, you can see that that kind of stones used to make blue pigments came only from certain part of the world. While this is something really strange for us, for people who have been born and um, and lived in an industrialized world because I just go on the internet or in a fine art um, shop and ask for some blue, but I don't know where does that color come from. In the past it was very clear that any, every single country, every single material produced certain kind of um, hues and pigments and dyes. And this is what is one of the consequences. You have two stained glass. On the left, you have one from Germany, the south of Germany. And on the right, you have one from the south of France. The reason why the German one has a lot of yellow and the French one has a lot of red and blue is in fact because of the uh, pigments that were available at that period of time in that precise region of the world. That this is something completely um, strange for, from our way of um, thinking of the world and of color today. These are the few pigments that in the Renaissance were available to artists. And again, we are dealing with really um, small palette if we compare with something like that, that is the, the way we think color today, a huge amount of different um, um, pigment and tonalities th that we can choose from. Um, I'll show you these two examples. This is a painting from by Tintoretto and uh, I discovered while I was researching for the book that the browns you see in these paintings were made with um, um, a particular kind of pigment that was made from the um, dust from mummies. They brought mummies from the from from the Egypt, and they used that kind of uh, very very old material made from 
well, death bodies, of course, to make this brown kind of pigment. But the, the, the fascinating thing is that Tintoretto and the painters of those days believed that putting that kind of uh, dead body dust uh, put something magical inside the painting. It was a sort of ritual that um, gave, um, yes, something powerful at the painting beyond what we were looking. Or if you look at this one, this is across from the Middle Age, and the head of Christ is something that they found from the ancient Rome and is, um, is, is the face from a small statuette of a woman made of lapis lazuli. I find this object absolutely fascinating because you have two different kinds of material, the gold of the body and the stone of the head, but also the head is the head of, the, of a woman. So you have a mixture of gender, color, materials, this really sounds strange for our way of thinking, but it was quite common in the past. I mean, like the mummy dust I just said, color was something precious, something beyond what you look at. So what happens today? This is what happens today. We really deal with color more as a perception than as a precious material. And this changes completely the way we value color because we talk mainly of hue, saturation, tonality, um, brightness. All these adjectives really tell something about what appear to our eyes, not what is inside color. And so this is our world. We watch a lot of pictures, a lot of images through screens that emit color. And sometimes this, um, this continuous experience with bright colors can change our experience of the color of the past. For example, my students are always or often disappointed when they go to the galleries because when they look at this, they say, well, we were expecting something more bright. It wasn't the kind of yellow we, we thought it was going to be. And this is because our first experience with art and design nowadays is through a smartphone, is through a screen. I'm not saying this with a moralistic intent. I don't think we are living in a, in a bad world. But um, the reason I was fascinated with color is what it, it, it is because I wanted to investigate how the way we look at things change when techno technological uh, device change, when the cultural change, where um, the values, the economical values, the religious values change in the world. So in a way, Chromorama is a, is a book, book about color, but is also a metaphor about cultural relativism. Is the point of view is what make color speak. So this is my very brief introduction and I'm back to you, Emma. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating. And um, yeah, so great to see, see those images and, and kind of why, why you wanted to include them. I mean, there's just so like, there's so much there, even though that was a very brief introduction, it kind of feel like you covered a hell of a lot of ground. Um, and so something that, that I guess you mentioned very early on when you when you showed the, um, I can't remember the name of the image, but the Jesus and Judas one, and then kind of going on to the Simpsons, I suppose really speaks to how we are kind of uh, bombarded with images today. Um, and like you said, you're not kind of making a moral judgment on that, but it does impact, I suppose, the way that we kind of consume art for want of a better word and, um, I guess negotiate how how we kind of interact with images and that sort of thing um and so how do you feel that that kind of constant bombardment i guess of images and, and obviously as such colors kind of affects um the way that we sort of appreciate those images or or how or how we enjoy them i suppose 
Well, I think one of the um, things that uh, are more difficult in uh, our world is to stay concentrated on things. We are always distracted by something. Um, as you said, I mean, the images are so many, the colors are so many, the facts are so many, the news, the stories, that we sometimes have difficulties to make a hierarchy to decide what is important and what is not. And for example, this is something that I work a lot with my students. And because they are between 19 and 21 and they live with the smartphone all the time, and um, images can be something that fill your life, but sometimes it's difficult to understand which one is something that really um, deals with what you are interested in. So uh, I think it, it's a richness at the end because we can choose, but we have to choose. We have the responsibility to choose for ourselves to decide when we want these images to be in, in, our, in our life, for example. So it's a fascinating period of time, but it's much more difficult to move um, among images that was in the past. I mean, if you think, um, how was the world before the industrialization? Images were really not that common. I mean, if you live in the country, um, probably the only images you see, you saw were the one um, on Sunday at the church or something like that, because you didn't have advertising magazines and so on. The, so it, it was really a different, a different world. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, that's, that's kind of a very recent thing as well. I was reading about, um, you know, the artist Botero who does the kind of big, mm -hmm. yeah, the, the big, I, was getting, I don't really know. yeah I guess very exaggerated forms and things like that um and you know this is kind of 20th century stuff and he was saying that the only art that he ever grew up surrounded by was was yeah the stuff in the stuff in churches that was kind of all that he'd seen yeah and went traveling around Europe to kind of educate himself in in all the old masters and that sort of thing so that's a you know that's a very very recent thing and I guess it's all very easy for us kind of in this quite nice um western bubble to to assume that that level of engagement with images but um but yeah it's not it's uh it's not the case um again going back to your intro um the the dust from mummies thing that, yes. that pretty nuts um yeah i wanted to ask you a bit more about that because it's fascinating on a number of levels one how did people work out that you could use that as a brown pigment and that idea that you mentioned about the the kind of ritual and how using essentially a dead person within a painting it feels like when people make like jewelry out of out of people's ashes or something like that doesn't yes, it yes yes um, i wondered if there's any more kind of like particularly odd or macabre stories around color that that really hit you in in the making of the book and and yeah if you know any more about the the mummy stuff then i'm all ears mm. Yes, this is a funny story. Well, you have to consider that um, in the past, I mean, till the 18th century, painting was really felt as a craft, but also as something that had magical and esoteric virtues. For example, painters decided to start a painting in certain days of the year because the astrology said that that was the right moment to start. And so the link between the time of the year, the planets, the, the, the astrological sign, the stones connected with the, the sign were all linked together in a very, um, I would say, rich and articulated world. Very fascinating, absolutely fascinating. So the, the, the really, the strongest difference um, between that kind of world and today is, as I was trying to say before, is the fact that now we, when we look at something like design or art or color, we really are judging what appear to our eyes. While in the past, they also appreciated what was within the material, even if that kind of virtue was not visible to the eyes. For example, 
if you look at the, the painting by Tintoretto and you don't know that there is mummy dust in the impasto, uh, you cannot feel that kind of magical feelings. Um, just to give you a different example of this, um, well, mummy dust was absolutely expensive, very, very expensive. It was, it was one of the most expensive pigments just after gold and lapis lazuli. Expensive means 100 times a simple color. For example, if you use black is one pound, if you use mummy dust is 100 pounds for the same amount of pigment. This is really, really difficult for us to understand. I mean, I've, I'm, I was born in the 70s and the first time I went to buy some paint I was about, well, eight or nine, something like that. No, maybe, well, probably I was 10. And in the fine art shop, old pigments for, well, children cost the same. I mean, if I wanted to buy a blue pigment or a red one, I mean, all the tubes were absolutely the same price. It wasn't the case in the Renaissance. I mean, blue was a hundred times more expensive than black. And people knew that. I mean, people, when we, they watched paintings and they saw the Madonna with the blue veil, they could understand that that part of the painting was more expensive than another one. We have completely lost this kind of economic uh, evaluation of images. Uh, one of the examples I always do, um, I mean, if you go in a shop and you want to buy a shirt and they have the same shirt in red, blue, green, yellow, whatever you want, you pay just the design and the price is always the same, although the color changes. In the past, a blue shirt was in, in, incredibly more expensive than a white one. So I find fun in a way studying the past because you see a completely different eye, different gaze on things. I mean, the magical things, the economic things were all linked together in a, yes, in a, in a completely different approach. In a way we lost something because we just judge the appearances of things nowadays when it comes to these facts. On another level, we, I think we are in a privileged position because we can have both. I mean, if we are a little bit curious, we can enter that kind of esoteric world and at the same time being in our industrialized society and industrial gaze. Yeah, for sure. And, and that I think ties in with something that's a common thread throughout the book, I suppose, which is um, the unstable idea of how subjective it is that we see colour, I suppose. I, I, I think maybe we all assume that we like or dislike things because we're, you know, fabulously individual and that's just our, just our taste. But obviously throughout history, as you say, certain colours would, would hold a certain place in in society or, or a certain value because of simply how expensive they were. Hence, you know, we, we always hear the, the kind of things about how, I don't know, purple at a particular point was favored by royals because of, of how expensive it was. So color has always had those connotations, I guess, with, um, well, that it's economic value, but also I suppose many other factors that maybe don't make it quite as subjective, even in this day and age, as we'd like to think it is. Um, so that idea of subjectivity was something I was quite interested in um, because colour obviously plays a big role in, in society and in marketing and all that sort of stuff. And how far do you think that, that we can have kind of totally like, um, ob yeah, objective views of, of what we like and don't like, and I guess what are the what are the factors aside from the kind of economic things that you've mentioned that maybe play into that today? Right. Um, well, one of the um, the reason I wanted to write this book is because um, since I was a child, I like rainy days. I like rainy days a lot. I like when everything is gray and dull and a little bit 
um, dark. And it, it, it was something that um, made me think a lot because in our society, we tend to think that sunny days and bright colors and bright days are better than rainy days and dull colors and grays. I mean, yellow is much more happy than gray. And I always said to myself, well, yes, maybe, yes. In, in, it, it is like that for many people, but it's not for me. And talking to people, I discovered that everyone, each of, each of us has different feelings toward color. There is not a common ground. The common ground is in stereotypes, in fiction, in stories. I mean, we do understand when we watch a movie that um, a dark feeling is more linked to thriller or dark stories or mysteries and these kind of things. And we do understand in movies that when it's rainy, uh, there is a dull feelings about characters and so on. But said that, we have a subjective emotion linked to colors. This is why I'm, I don't believe in general theories of color like uh, chromotherapy and this kind of things, because they tend to give a universal meaning to certain use that are the same for all the people. So um, one of the fascinating things to study color is, is that you have to keep in mind these different things all at the same time. You have some universal values, national values, historical values, that change, but can change at different speed. And then you have the history of the singular person who can have completely different feelings about color um, that not necessarily are the same of the um, period of the society they are living in. For example, we know that in the Western world, dark hues are believed to be elegant, blue navy, black and so on. But if you go to India, it's quite the opposite. I mean, magenta is absolutely elegant even for men. And this is quite the opposite of what we know. Um, as I was saying before, uh, color is really something that make you confront with cultural relativism. That doesn't mean that any meaning is fine or it's just mean that color in, in itself doesn't mean something per se or above culture. You have to find the right, you have to stay within a culture to understand what that color wants to mean to people. This is also the reason why probably the weakest way of studying color is through symbolism because symbolism really changes a lot. So it's not something that stays forever. I mean, we believe, I mean, red is linked to love and passion, but it wasn't the case always. I don't know if I, 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 lost, I lost a bit, a bit myself while I was talking. I don't know if I answer your question. No, that was great. Absolutely. No, you absolutely did. Um, yeah, I think red's always the obvious one that's used when people talk about, um, I guess, the semiotics of colour and how that changes across different parts of the world, because mm. as you say, we associate it with, um, well, I guess, danger and passion. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, in, in other parts of the world, kind of like in the, in the East, and it has very different meanings. Um, and it kind of made that, that sort of thing made me think, I guess, about um, also the way that things like superstition play into colour. I don't know how well these phrases translate in Italian, but in England, people say things like red and green should never be seen and apparently that's something to do with poisonous plants or like red sky at night shepherd's delight and all those sort of things yeah so we have, we have similar proverbs not oh, yeah. the same but we do have similar ones yes yeah yeah um which i which i feel like maybe kind of relates to um that really nice little nugget of information about how painters would paint on certain days according to astrology and mm. stones and that sort of thing it's really lovely to hear that because i feel like that kind of stuff is very um maybe maligned as as uh, kind of hippie woo woo but um i'm going to i'm going to be telling everyone about how how it's got like real historical art historical precedent um but going back to i guess that idea of subjectivity and it was interesting to hear what you said about uh, 
not really buying into things like chromotherapy and and that sort of thing and when you say that do you mean things like how people might go into like a children's ward in a hospital and be like this will cheer them up let's paint all the walls yellow is that the sort yes of thing? yes something like that i mean um because i mean we built our uh, feelings and also our tastes since we are uh, very young i mean psychologist says that what shape our cultural mind is something that happens between the age of three and nine. I strongly believe that the experience you have in that particular period of your life shape your gaze when you are uh, for, for the rest of your life. So for example, I was when I was talking about the rainy days is to say, how strong is my feeling with some kind of um, grays or beige and this kind of colors. But I also have a great passion for red. For red. And so there is a connection between our mind or our soul. It depends on how you want to feel it and, and, and talk about it and certain kind of um, views. But I don't think this is universal. This is the strong thing to understand. I mean, it's, it's really important to understand that is something very subjective. So I, I, I'm quite sure that you can paint a uh, room in yellow or in red, and that can change your mood, your feelings, and even your health. I'm quite sure of that. But it's not something that you can prove scientifically and says yellow will heal every human being, because it's really something that deals with yourself, with your way of deciding how the space you are living in should be um, painted of or made of. I'm quite skeptical of the any kind of universalistic approach to this subject. I think it's also quite dangerous because tends to, um, well, judge all the people the same way. I don't know if it's, it's the, this is the, um, probably judge is not the, the word to categorize people all in the same way. I mean, yeah. e every human being is happy with yellow. No, it's not like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's interesting to think about that because um, that's probably breaking a few kind of marketers and um, branding people's hearts, isn't it? Because um, I'm, I'm thinking about the sway that branding has, and there's no, there's no doubt that like good branding and good advertising kind of makes us buy certain things or potentially behave in certain ways but thinking about stuff like public health messaging and namely um when however long ago it was I don't know five ten years ago when they um made the cigarette packaging when you weren't allowed to have branding on cigarette packaging and I remember one of the biggest because I remember writing about that story and one of the biggest kind of design elements was that they deliberately chosen this green that was meant to be like the most abhorrent and off-putting green color that you could find and just kind of I mean it's not I mean it's not a nice color in my opinion but it was yeah it was just really fascinating to kind of have that assumption about how people view color used in a in a public health way I don't know um mm. Yeah, I thought that was that was pretty wild. Um, moving on to something that you just touched on very briefly about cinema and I and this kind of symbolism of different colours in cinema. And as an Italian, I wanted to talk to you about Dario Argento and oh, do, do you like him? <laughs> yes, I do. Yeah, like all of that giallo stuff, I think, is really fascinating, and it kind of ties in with with that idea of using colour as a tool to convey a message and also how colour is also kind of a product of just what you have to hand and kind of because with Argento I mean correct me if I'm wrong my understanding is that he was kind of using like the very last of a particular film stock I think it was maybe yes. a coat and that's why he got those amazing colours so um yeah I just wanted to talk to you a little bit more um maybe about colour in cinema and I know that you mentioned kind of um it's vertigo in the book that you talk about quite a lot 
but maybe yeah talk to me about any particularly fascinating examples of of how directors have used color and and how it kind of speaks to cinema audiences yeah well um well talking about Dario Argento he, I remember he once said that when we, he made Suspiria at the end of the 70s is the thing you were saying uh, they used um, it was one of the last movies to be printed by Technicolor and Technicolor was um, a way of printing the film not just developing like the other kind of color stocks and he wanted to use that technology that was quite old fashioned in a way because it was really Hollywood of the 30s and the 40s because he wanted to give the same feeling of Disney Snow White that kind of animated gothic contrast between blacks and red and blues and violets um, and I think that you can feel that when you watch uh, Suspiria. It really has something abstract like animation. And the, the kind of color movies I prefer are the ones that work that way. I mean, that use um, color in a, um, yes, abstract, symbolic, uh, painterly way. It's not just that the film is in color because you are um, filming the world and the world is full of color, you decide, I mean, the director decide which color should use to um, give you a certain kind of mood and feeling and, uh, and also to tell something about the psychology of the characters. I think this is really, really, really fascinating if you look at um, in that way. I mean, for animation, this is quite the the norm because animation is is designed from beginning to end there is no frame that hasn't been drawn or painted uh, uh, so it's quite it's, in, it's not that common for um, live action movies to reason the same way but certain di di directors do that and one of the probably the most fascinating thing that um, coloring movies uh, has invented that wasn't there before is the fact to uh, lighten a space with um, color dominance. For example, everything is red, everything is green, everything is blue. That really is something that didn't exist before movies. I mean, we don't have paintings that reason like that. Well, yes, sometimes we have some paintings from the 19th centuries that says this is a sunset but it, it wasn't really the norm while movies really invented the kind of this kind of um painting the space painting the atmosphere in a way and i think it's really really powerful yeah absolutely absolutely i guess one of the really obvious ways that color is used as a kind of narrative point is in the Wizard of Oz, obviously, which starts off in black and white, and then they find yeah. the road, and then it becomes that beautiful kind of it's those like really like rich but kind of baby blues and and the yellows and all that stuff. It's um yeah really stunning, and it also made me think of um have you seen Black Narcissus, the Powell and Pressburger film? Yeah, yes. The color in that stuff is really really stunning, and again, it kind of ties back into I suppose what we were talking about with availability of, of different um, kind of tones and hues and that sort of thing, because it, it's very obvious when you think about kind of painting pigments, but I guess with the advent of being able to shoot digitally rather than using film and stuff, how far do you feel like maybe cinema's relationship with colour has changed when you don't have to think about the physicality of, of, of kind of putting that color through and, and that sort of thing. Right. Um, well, I think what's really changed in the last 20 years is the fact that nowadays not only film directors can uh, manipulate color, but everyone can do. I mean, everyone who does a small video on the smartphone nowadays, a small reel or a history on Instagram, can change the color, the feeling, the use. I mean, the filters really do that. I mean, the filters have names that work and 
think in that way. So people are more aware how you can manipulate the point of view on things, making things warmer, more dramatic or more uh, happy, just shifting a little bit of the, of the um, color dominance in the images. Well, another thing that I was thinking while uh, I was talking before is the fact, for example, that is uh, quite interesting that in Japanese um, anime and manga, they use different color for different um, hair to mean the, um, something about the psychology of the character. So they, they have a quite um, larger palette than the Western one. Characters can have green hair, blue hair, and it's not just because they dyed their color, their hair, but it's really a way of conveying something about the inside of the, of the characters. This so, is something that we don't do. Yeah, well, apart from in, now I've just totally forgotten the name of it and it's really obvious, that film with um, Jim Carrey. Yeah. And, oh God, what is that called? And she changes her hair color, doesn't she, according to yes. the film progress? Oh, God, yes, I, I know which one you mean, and, um, and Kate Winslet, is it? Yeah, I think Kate Winslet yeah. is all about, um, and they can kind of, eternal sunshine of spotless mind. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yes. But that's very interesting about the manga stuff as well. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't know that. Um, so I guess we've, we've got a couple more minutes. So I suppose just to round things off, it would be great to hear about... Um, because, again, so much of the book is about how we, like how we see, obviously, that's even the kind of subheading. But, yeah, kind of having that, having that kind of agile and curious and critical eye and not taking everything at face value and that sort of thing. Um, and I was interested to know kind of any myths that were busted or any kind of inherited things about what colour means or what colour is or any kind of surprising stories um that you wanted to share to round things off well um the spirit of the book is really um to talk about color using many different objects not just paintings because the book of about color that i've been um studying were mainly about paintings and art and i wanted to use every kind of colored object from things you, that you can find at the supermarket and movies and paintings and illustration and whatever. And when you start studying really the stuff that are around you in the everyday life, there is when you find the more surprising stories because something that just seemed common, normal, obvious, it, it wasn't really like that just 10 or 20 years ago. Well probably the most surprising one of all is the fact that the stereotype of dressing boys and girls in blue and pink is really really recent it's something that came out in the 50s so it's not something that is so ancient to deal with a um, profound meaning it's really something invented by politics and marketing uh, probably the, the reason is that um, Mamie as an hour, the, the, the first lady had pink as a favorite color, and she uses a lot, used a lot in many different occasions. And American women started to imitate her. And when the Barbie doll came out at the end of the 50s, it was all pink, but it was, was very fashionable to use that kind of um, shade. And then all the producer of um, toys for girls started to imitate. And in 20 years or so, pink was to girls. It's so conventional because in this, the century before, all the girls were dressed in blue because it was a kind of um, small version of the Holy Virgin to dress girls in blue. So, you said, um, you use the term critical. What I always say to my students, to be critical about convention, culture, and um, point of view is to take a distance from 
things, especially from the past, but also being aware that in 20 years time, probably what we think today will change completely and we will be put under a critical eye. And this is something that we always have to keep in mind. Yeah, totally. That's that's really fascinating. Um, just just a quick one on, on what you were just saying about um, the kind of boys and girls colours. Is is that quite a recent thing then? I guess for for colours to be gendered um, in that sense. You mentioned before the the girls being dressed in blue, like the Virgin Mary, which is obviously very problematic in itself. But um, but yeah, so so is is gendering colour a fairly recent thing? Yes, it's, it's something that came out in the 20th century with, um, well, I would say with the marketing needs. Because if you look at different period of time, Italian Renaissance or um, France in the 18th century, every color was possible for every person. I mean, at Versailles, men wore pink, uh, light shade of violets, I mean, all kinds of colors that we can consider girly in our culture, but it's really a marketing invention. There is nothing linked to gender and color. There is nothing in our biologist that says that blue is for men. Absolutely not. There is no proof of that. No, I've, but, I've never... But marketing needs to categorize because if they can convince people that some, certain things are better for them, you can sell more items of that kind. Yeah, totally. It's like peanut butter for dogs, isn't it? Which I found. Yes. Um, which obviously I bought, but um, but it is just peanut butter. Uh, that's been really, really fascinating. There's just, I mean, we could talk about this stuff for for days and days and days because um, it just kind of does touch on absolutely everything, doesn't it? And um, it's been really, really fascinating. And not just saying this because you're here, but can't recommend the book highly enough. It's every single page has something that you go wow okay it's it's a really really interesting subject and thank you so much for thank you about it so eloquently thank you emily cheers